We respect the atom bomb. But how many of us respect this? This dishful of disease-producing organisms, if allowed to grow unchecked, may be capable of more widespread loss of life than a dozen atom bombs. But scientists have found a strong defense, vaccines, which stimulate the formation of antibodies. Once formed, they may remain in the blood and confer immunity against another attack of the same disease. I was taught in medical school that vaccines are safe and they're effective. I had no reason to believe otherwise. It wasn't until the New York State passing of the hepatitis B mandate in 1991. It struck me as kind of odd that they were mandating a vaccine for newborn babies when babies were not at risk for developing hepatitis B infection. It made me question whether or not we're doing a service to children by giving them all these vaccines and injections. There's more than just an assumption that vaccines are safe. It is pretty much regarded as law. But I don't think it's that black and white. There are many grays. And you have more and more people who are questioning it, and with good reason, because the science is not there to really state that vaccines are truly safe. Well, my wife is five months pregnant, and I'm for parental rights, not government coercion, telling us uh, what we can do, what we can't do with our kids. There is no other mandated procedure in our, that is, it's, first of all, it's illegal. You can't have, you can't make, um, you can't make people do procedures that they don't want. The parents have to be the ones who make the decisions for what's best for, my, for, for our kids. It can't be the government saying that. It's against the Nuremberg laws. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's against the state constitution, and it's against their own bylaws here. I mean, I was reading the, I've been reading some legislation that was passed years ago about they used to do state sterilizations, and they thought that that was a good thing. You know, so you, you can't let the state make the decisions. The people have to decide, and parents have to decide, and that's why I'm here. They've gone from when you and I were kids, you had like eight shots. Now that's up to 70 shots and multi-shots. And they don't tell you the, the safety of these things. There is no, there's no efficacy study. And the toxicity of these things, we're having more and more side effects. You're having more and more autism. When you go from autism, which was unheard of in America in 1930, to almost one in 5,000 after um, seeds started being um, preserved with mercury, which is the second most toxic thing on this planet next to plutonium, mm -hmm. and then you go to, let's go up a couple of decades, by 1990 it was 1 in 200, now it's 1 in 88. Now truthfully, it's true that a lot of the autism rates are grouped into one, but there is something that's really happening. And one of the, the most vulnerable things you can do to a child who doesn't have an immune system is give them a shot. And I'll just give you one example. You take the hepatitis B, okay? The hepatitis, you're only going to get that from drug use, and you're going to get that from um, intravenous drug use and get from sexual contact. And yet, they won't let a baby out of the hospital unless insisting on getting the shot. I'm sorry. There's an unnecessary shot that they don't need to have, when, especially when the baby's immune system isn't developed. The baby's immune system is the mother's immune system. So it is beyond ridiculous. It's criminal. Government can't make decisions on what I do to my body and my children's body. That, they have to stay out of that. That's not something that's open for discussion. I've got to make my choice, and I'm going to do what's best for my child. And to the idea that they're going to mandate that you, if I don't want to vaccinate my kids, they can't go to school unless they get a consent from a doctor, that's lunacy. Show them the thimerosal bomb, which we keep in a metal container because we're a little afraid of it, and it's a very fine powder. This is, this is thimerosal, which is labeled very toxic, has cumulative effects, can cause damage to the kidneys, to the respiratory system, skin, to the uh, nervous system. It specifically warns on here that it can cause reproductive and developmental toxicity, meaning that it can cause things like autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. This is immensely toxic stuff. And it's in vaccine. And this is what's in the vaccine. It's important to, to realize we're talking about a whole range of products. Vaccines are a big one because, of course, you're directly injecting it. For example, this is tetanus vaccine. This one expires 
It's a little outdated now in 2007. And here's the thimerosal. One to 10,000 is a preservative. Perhaps the, the biggest one in the US, at least, that's expo uh, for exposure to mercury is the influenza vaccine. Influenza vaccine is now recommended for all pregnant women, all infants, all children on a yearly basis. You, you're supposed you to have last shot. year's influenza. Understand that thimerosal is not added at the end. It's not like, well, that factory next year can make thimerosal free. Thimerosal, you either have to have a thimerosal free factory or you have to not have one. They add thimerosal at each step because the factory is not clean and not sterile. So you either have to have an expensive sterile factory where you don't need thimerosal or you have to have one that produces thimerosal. It's going to need thimerosal or something the whole time. It needs to be stopped. This is uh, the influenza vaccine from Adventist Pasteur, their flu zone. Thimerosal, 25 micrograms of mercury per dose. But I'd like to point out that a lot of people didn't know, and, and I'm one of them. I've given 2,000 Rogam shots. I've been in vaccines for 35 years. I didn't know that Rogam had thimerosal in it. So I think a lot of the doctors were unaware. They were unaware that even the word thimerosal meant mercury. He had been this bright, precocious baby, speaking in full sentences by the age of two. After that shot, we got the diagnosis that he was minimally brain damaged and the recommendation was to put him in a self-contained classroom for the learning disabled. I became committed to reforming the mass vaccination system and I worked for 30 years to make vaccine policies safer. In the 1980s, children were being asked to get 23 doses of seven vaccines. In the last three decades, that number has grown to 69 doses of 16 vaccines. That's triple the numbers of doses of vaccines we gave our children in the early 1980s. Rates of autism are jumping, an alarming 10 to 17 percent every year. Every 20 minutes in this country, another child is diagnosed with autism. All you have to do is ask the guidance counselors, the teachers, the principals, and all of them across the board will tell you that we are seeing a rise in the number of children with disabilities. That is clear. The CDC states that one in 110 children have autism. But autism is just one piece of a bigger problem. The bigger issue is that one in six kids in this country has some form of neurodevelopmental disability. 50 years ago, children didn't even get type 2 diabetes. Now, it's an emerging epidemic, as are a long list of ailments, which used to be rare and have now been mainstreamed. Things like asthma and autism and acid reflux and arthritis, allergies, adult acne, attention deficit disorder. And that's just the A's. <laughs> Vaccine safety is not just about autism. Autism is only one kind of brain and immune dysfunction that is associated with vaccination. Millions and millions of children now in America are chronically ill and disabled. And during the same time period that the numbers of doses of vaccines have more than tripled that we're giving our children, we have seen this explosion of chronic disease and disability. And to take off the table, the use of a pharmaceutical product like a vaccine as a potential cofactor in this explosion of chronic disease and disability among our children is irresponsible. Yeah. If we talk about the children who have learning disabilities, who weren't born that way, but who have learning disabilities, if we talk about the children who develop ADD, attention deficit disorder, if we talk about the children who have PDD, the pervasive developmental disorder, Asperger's, uh, every kind of disease process that you can talk about that has this neurologic learning problem. When we add those children into the mix, and I believe firmly that they should be added, that they are all on one spectrum and it's one process, you're talking about one child in every six. And those numbers were not like that. 
you will talk to teacher after teacher who's been in this business of teaching children for 30 years and they will all tell you it wasn't like that when I started teaching it's like that now and something has changed and they laugh the teachers laugh when a physician says oh it's just better diagnosis they were all there before I can promise you that if you had had this many children walking through grocery stores having full-on meltdown temper tantrums 30 years ago it would have been diagnosed as autism so about 10 years ago a mother came up to me and said hey doc did you know there's mercury in vaccines and i hadn't a clue and so my question was well if mercury is in the vaccines what else is in the vaccines so i open up the package inserts and I see mercury and aluminum and formaldehyde and antibiotics and then preservatives like polysorbate 80. So I asked the pediatric resident, I said, tell me, how does the body process those materials? She could not answer me. And no one in science can because no one has looked. Health Canada says the best way to avoid the flu is vaccination, which in many provinces is free. Well, let's see if these recent flu shot recipients can help reveal the mystery of why Cheetos and Pop-Tarts list their ingredients while vaccines do their best not to. Are you aware of the ingredients in the vaccine? Uh, I know there's some egg products. I don't think they offered us a list of ingredients, so... That, no, I don't know. This is blind faith for me. But did you know that there's uh, mercury in that shot? No, I didn't. Oh, I did not, no. Are you glad that it's free? Yes. But you know it's not really free? Yes. Well, that's paying for, through our taxes, right? So. If I sneeze right now, would you be okay with that? No. <laughs> well, these people confirm two things. Some are happy to wait in line for a secret serum, and nobody likes getting sneezed on. <laughs> but what if drug companies are right? What if tricking your body into thinking it's already sick doesn't make you sick? What if there's not enough vaccine to go around? You should know that making your own is easier than brewing your own beer. <laughs> and it could save your life. Well, the first thing you need is a live virus. Now, is there anyone here suffering from the flu? Uh, I, uh, Sir, would you favor us by discharging directly onto these chicken embryos? Uh, I, anything I could do to help. <laughs> okay. We now have our chicken embryos and our live virus. Now, from the pickled frog jar, your local school's biology class, we'll keep that virus dead like the drug companies do with formaldehyde. Now, careful, don't get any frog in the mix. That'd be gross. Now, uh, let's add a little ether. Whew, careful, don't fall asleep. And then we dump some detergent in there. That keeps it clean. And... Remember when your mother lost her mind when you played with mercury because it never leaves your body? Well, that makes it a great preservative. If you have a thermometer... Well, staying healthy is a lot more important than room temperature. Now, all of this goes into the centrifuge, like this blender, and... Hey, hey, hey! It's vaccine for the whole family. Well, the debate over whether vaccines usually don't work or aren't fully safe may never end, which at least explains why the contents are rarely publicized. Uh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> But it's government recommended. <laughs> oh, well, that's my eye on the flu shot. You would think that the FDA would take each of those ingredients and study them in, in human infants to make sure that each of, the, each of those ingredients are safe. Well, they haven't done that. They ha they've never taken vaccine quantities of each of those ingredients and done any sort of safety testing to confirm that each one of those ingredients are safe. I'm a neuroscientist by training, and my studies are in the origin of neurological disease. I develop animal models of Parkinson's and Lugaric's disease. Recently, we've been looking at aluminum, which is common to many vaccines. It's used as an adjuvant that means helper. Without the aluminum, the vaccine basically does not provide any long-term protection. 
And so my research has looked at injectable vac uh, aluminum and how it might impact the nervous system. The difference between injectable aluminum versus dietary aluminum is that aluminum that you eat is excreted fairly rapidly. Injectable aluminum, however, is meant to stick around. And that's precisely why it's there in the first place. That's what an adjuvant does. So we simply did this, the really simple experiment of taking the same stuff out of the vaccines, the aluminum hydroxide, and injecting it into mice, into the muscles, to see what would happen if we tried to mimic the vaccine schedule. We were quite surprised to see how rapidly the behavioral symptoms emerged. They showed not only behavioral deficits, motor function, but they ultimately showed cognitive deficits as well. And once we sacrificed the animals and started looking inside their brains and spinal cords, we found massive damage to motor neurons. And so we may be creating the conditions for Parkinson's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, Alzheimer's disease, maybe not immediately, but maybe 20, 30, 40 years down, down the road. When I first saw her, she was having problems with seizures, intractable headaches, chest pains, and I found out that she began having problems following the, her Gardasil vaccinations. In my opinion, there's little room for doubt concerning that this condition was caused by the Gardasil. Every time she got a, another injection, she got worse and worse. I think Gardasil should be taken off the market and hasn't been well tested before it was placed in the general public. The FDA has a particular process that's called fast tracking when there is a promising drug that comes forward. Gardasil, they had scheduled a four-year trial, but after 15 months, they went to the FDA and said, there is nothing like this vaccine on the market. Would you please consider this for fast track? And the FDA said, yes. So within six months, they approved it. And as soon as they had it approved, Merck said, we will no longer continue our trial. We're going to stop our trial because our drug is now approved. It is a, a, an example of why no vaccine, particularly a vaccine for children, should ever be fast-tracked by the FDA. Less than 1% of all cancer deaths are for cervical cancer. And yet we now have a vaccine that was only studied in 1,200 girls under the age of 16 before it was recommended for universal use by the CDC in all 11 and 12 year old girls in this country. That's not science, that's politics. Texas Governor Rick Perry has ordered that schoolgirls in his state must get the Gardasil shot. It's also worth pointing out that the AP says that Governor Perry has ties to Merck, including the fact that one of the company's lobbyists in the state of Texas is his former chief of staff. the legal right to follow our conscience when making educated vaccine decisions for our families. If the state can force you to put your life on the line or your child's life on the line for any medical intervention, then the state has too much power. More than 2,000 Prince George's County students have not gotten their state-mandated shots. Tonight, an ultimatum to some of those parents, come to court, get the shots, or else. More than 1,600 students and their parents have been ordered to appear in circuit court for the children to be immunized. We can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way, but it's going to have to get done. I went over there and saw the parents lining up. They had police with dogs and guns patrolling the courthouse. I thought to myself, there is something wrong with this. We shouldn't be summoning parents under threat of imprisonment and fines because they didn't get their children a hepatitis B vaccination or a, or a chickenpox vaccination. Americans are well aware that a number of prescription drugs that have been licensed as safe have been found to be unsafe after they're used by millions of people. And yet, when it comes to vaccines, which are mandated by law, there's somehow this separation made. The vaccines couldn't possibly be the same. The majority of vaccine research is paid for by the vaccine manufacturers themselves. So the people who are approving the vaccines are taking the word of the pharmaceutical companies. 
The pharmaceutical companies have been allowed to be too present at the table at the FDA and the CDC. And I think a firewall needs to be built between those in, in government who are regulating, making policy for, and developing vaccines, and those pharmaceutical companies that are making profit off the sale of vaccines. You know, it's no wonder parents are asking questions. It's because doctors that are making these policies are financially benefiting from these policies. The ACIP is the organization that approves vaccine policy for the United States. You have some doctors on that board that have a direct financial interest in these vaccines. That's a huge conflict of interest. Do you believe anybody who is getting funds from Merck or any of the other pharmaceutical companies uh, should be on advisory panels that are making judgments about uh, pharmaceuticals coming from those companies? Or do you believe that's a conflict of interest? I think that's a difficult question to answer. <laughs> Wait a minute, let me get this straight. You think it's a difficult question to answer if somebody is getting funding of some type from a pharmaceutical company for them to sit on an advisory panel that's approving or giving their approval to a new drug that's coming on the market, you don't see that as a conflict? It's important to point out that recommendations for vaccination are made independently by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Family Physicians. And those recommendations are virtually always in harmony with the recommendations from the Advisory <laughs> Committee on Immunization Practices. <laughs> the pharmaceutical industry is probably the most powerful lobbying force in Washington, D.C. There are 535 members of Congress, the House and the Senate. There are over 600 lobbyists for the pharmaceutical industry. They are a very powerful force. They give a lot of money to both political parties. They give a lot of money to individual candidates. They don't give me any, but they give an awful lot of money to various uh, candidates, and they have a, a very strong lobbying effort. And so getting anything done in Congress that pharma, the, the pharmaceutical industry, doesn't want done is very, very difficult. That is one of the problems. The other problem is they have very, very strong influence with the Food and Drug Administration uh, and uh, Health and Human Services and CDC. And uh, it, because of their, their strength, it's very difficult to, uh, to uh, get change made. I mean, we're talking today about autism, but there's something even or as great at stake here as, as the autism question and whether or not the MMR vaccine and other vaccines may be contributing to autism. And that is, are we letting pharmaceutical companies have too great an influence on the decision-making process that affects every one of our lives? Do we want to give a child nine vaccinations in one day? Do we want to give them 31 or 32 or 33 vaccinations between the time they're born and they're age six? Isn't that maybe a little bit overload? I ended up taking him to my pediatrician. She just said, oh, he's autistic. That's how it goes sometimes. You know, they're born that way. But we felt like there was something medically going on with him. So we took him to this doctor, and he said, the first thing I want to do is check him for heavy metals. I looked at those results, and the mercury was off the end of the page. I sort of freaked out. I thought, He's mercury poisoned. Where did that mercury come from? We tested the paint. We tested the air. I had the sawdust in my basement shop tested to see, is there mercury in that? When we talked to Dr. Green about it, told him what we were doing, he said, you don't have to look for where the mercury is coming from. We know where it's coming from. It's in the vaccines that Jordan's been getting. Good morning, guys. Since I began practicing in 1975, I saw one child with autism in the 80s, one child with autism in the early 90s, and then in the late 90s, I was literally flooded with patients. I've evaluated and treated now approximately 2,100 patients with autism. The children who are here, their parents will tell you, were definitely injured by vaccines. They were fine, and then they were gone. So if I have parents screaming, and I have science confirming 
that there's a problem with exposure to mercury, and there's a problem with exposure to aluminum, and there's a problem when you take a broken immune system and give it three live viruses on the same day, then why don't we just want to fix that? This is it's ridiculous that there are this many children in one little town, in one little pool, all of them who have the same story. Jordan received mercury far exceeding EPA safety guidelines. We know that mercury causes neurotoxicity. There's no controversy about that. Does it cause autism? It contributes to the damages that lead to autism. Jordan was not born with autism. He was a normal child. He was injured by vaccinations and the injuries led to his autism. Certainly this is a controversial point in the medical field because um, the, the conventional medical community has basically stated that there is no link between mercury and autism. The science has been very clear on this. We have six studies that show mercury containing vaccines don't cause autism. And although there can be slight flaws, I think, in any of those studies, once you have negative study after negative study after negative study, I think you can say with comfort that a truth has emerged. Almost all vaccine studies are epidemiological studies, which means that large groups of people are compared to each other. There has been very little bench science that is looking at what happens at the molecular and cellular level in the body. We really need to do both kind of studies in order to understand what really happens. The research is incomplete, and the certainty that's feisted on us by vaccine authorities uh, is not scientific. Since 1999, the amount of mercury has been reduced in vaccinations. But thimerosal is still present in some vaccines. And it's pretty clear from the scientific evidence that any form of mercury in the body is toxic and it can cause damage. vaccine program. It's one size fits all. Every child is the same. Every child needs to be vaccinated regardless of their family history or their medical background. What we don't know is what is sitting in their genetics that's potentially going to express itself or not express itself for a child to develop certain chronic illness. My oldest child has learning disabilities, asthma, numerous food allergies. My youngest son has a significant speech delay. When you look back through their medical records, they are all absolutely perfectly healthy until the day they are vaccinated. And then it is like clockwork. Every four weeks, every six weeks, we are at the doctor, runny nose, ear infection, asthma, respiratory problems. Since the vaccine has been licensed, there have been more than 18,000 serious adverse event reports made to VAERS. What's the government's response been to all of this? Their response has been to issue a report that says all of these reactions and adverse events and deaths are a coincidence. I'm so grateful that we're here together and across all of the different ways. Almost eight years ago, I think, we were at an autism rally, and we started talking to other people, and everybody had the same story about the mercury toxicity. And this one parent, George Mead, decided to go ahead with this class action, and we decided to join him in that. Jordan and William Mead were two of the test cases that were chosen to represent the lawsuit. The first thing that we learned is you can't, you can't sue the drug company that made the vaccine. Our lawyer 
explained to us how there was this court set up specifically to address all the vaccine injuries. Uh, there were a lot of uh, civil lawsuits against uh, vaccine manufacturers, and there were some extraordinary awards because there were very devastating injuries. So the vaccine uh, manufacturer said, this isn't profitable for us, we're not going to make vaccines anymore. So Congress stepped in and said, okay, we're going to um, stop lawsuits against manufacturers. Uh, you're not allowed to sue them unless you first go through this new program that we're setting up called the Vaccine Compensation Program, or the Vaccine Court. where presumably you could have 30, 40, 50 different vaccines recommended for university use and mandated, and absolutely no accountability. You have a prescription for disaster when you don't have anybody accountable in a court of law for what happens when vaccines go wrong. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so be God? I do. Thank you. See you. Everybody knows the value of vaccinations. And every time you testify, you tell us how valuable they've been. And we already know that. We're not here to say that vaccinations aren't important. They're very important. They've given us the highest quality of life of any civilization in the history of mankind. That ain't what we're talking about. We're talking about why they're putting mercury in vaccinations and why it's never been tested since 1929 when Lilly developed it. Mr. Egan. Has thimerosal ever been tested by our health agencies? Uh, it's been only in the, there were those early tests that you know of that were done by uh, Lilly. And when was, was that test acute. done? That was done in 1929. Yes. And, um, okay, well, let's, let's follow up on that. In 1929, they tested this on 27 people that were dying of meningitis. All of those people died of meningitis, and so they said there was no correlation between their death and the mercury in the vaccines. That is the only test that's ever been done on thimerosal that I know of. Can you t think of any other? No, in people, no, okay. the, except so, for accidental exposures over Okay, So we have mercury that's being put into people's bodies in the form of this preservative and has been since the 30s, and it's never been tested by our health agencies. And yet you folks come here and you testify that there's no conclusive evidence, that, conclusive evidence, and, and the IOM says they favor, get this, they don't say they're sure, they say they favor rejection of a causal relationship between mercury and autism and other neurological disorders. Mr. Egan, can you say to me right now that that amount of mercury being injected into a baby will not hurt it? It's, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible to make those categorical statements of 100 percent that's right that's what i want to say so so it is possible that the amount of mercury that's being injected even in trace amounts could damage a child neurologically right i don't think it has that capacity you know? <laughs> i mean that's you know we can argue i know but you don't think it is but you can't say categorically can you do i do i have evidence for every single child for every possible dose the answer is no there you go We've been after this now for eight years. Now, progress is being made, but sometimes I feel like it's, it's, it's pulling a wisdom tooth where they get in your mouth with both feet and both hands and they're in there jerking that tooth out. I mean, it's just so hard to, to get it moving. Why they have left it in the vaccines is because they say it's such a minute amount, it doesn't really hurt anybody. Uh, but that's begging the question. The question is, is it toxic or not? And it is. It should be out of everything that goes into the human body. And our health agencies, in my opinion, have been derelict in their responsibility of making sure that mercury is out of everything that goes into the human body, especially vaccines. Well, B says, be well. Be well, be well, be well, be well, be well. Be well, be well, be well be. Urge your family, friends, and neighbors to take the new oral polio vaccine. The new oral polio vaccine tastes good, works fast, and prevents polio. So to protect... We're taught in medical school that vaccines reduce the incidence rate of smallpox or polio. One of the things that's missing in medical education is that they're not the only thing that play a role as to whether or not diseases come and go. 
Today, what I'd like to talk about is the rationale of vaccines. There was an article in Pediatrics Journal, which is the Bible journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And this article looked at child mortality rates by age at death in the United States between 1900 and 1998. And you see all the death rates of these diseases actually came down before the DPT was licensed in 1949 and the measles vaccine was introduced in 1963. So what is it that actually helped? State and local health departments implemented public health measures and public education about hygienic practices. Thus, vaccination does not account for the impressive declines in mortality seen in the first half of the century. Vaccines are drugs. Parents need to understand that vaccines are drugs. Vaccines contain antigens, preservatives, adjuvants, stabilizers, antibiotics, buffers, diluents, emulsifiers, and inactivating chemicals. They also contain residue from animal and human growth mediums. Ingredients in vaccines. Antigens. These are the main components of any vaccine designed to induce an immune response. They are either weakened germs or fragments of the disease organism. Some examples include viruses, such as polio, measles, mumps, bacteria, such as Bordetella pertussis, and toxoids, such as Clostridium tetani. Ingredients in vaccines. Growth mediums. Viruses need a medium in which to propagate or reproduce. Common broths include chick embryo fibroblasts, chick kidney cells, mouse brains, African green monkey kidney or Vero cells, human diploid cells cultured from aborted human fetuses, MRC5, RA27-3, and WI38 are examples. Ingredients in vaccines. Adjuvants. These are used to enhance immunity. Aluminum salts have been linked to neurological disorders. Squalene may have been used in anthrax vaccines and was used in some H1N1 swine flu vaccines. Ingredients in vaccines. Preservatives. These are used to stop microbial contamination of vaccines. Thimerosal, or mercury, is a recognized developmental toxin and suspected immune, kidney, skin, and sense organ toxin. Benzethonium chloride is a suspected endocrine, skin, and sense organ toxin. 2. Phenoxyethanol is a suspected developmental and reproductive toxin. It is also chemically similar to antifreeze. Phenol is a suspected blood, developmental, liver, kidney, neuro, reproductive, respiratory, skin, and sense organ toxin. Ingredients in vaccines. Stabilizers. These are used to inhibit chemical reactions and prevent vaccine contents from separating or sticking to the vial. Fetal bovine calf serum is a commonly used stabilizer. Monosodium glutamate, MSG, helps the vaccine remain unchanged when exposed to heat, light, acidity, or humidity. Human serum albumin helps stabilize live viruses. Porcine pig gelatin, which protects vaccines from freeze drying or heat, can cause severe allergic reactions. Ingredients in vaccines. Antibiotics. These are added to prevent bacterial growth during vaccine production and storage. Neomycin is a developmental toxin and suspected neurotoxin. Streptomycin is a suspected blood, skin, and sense organ toxin. Polymyxin B is a suspected liver and kidney toxin. Ingredients in vaccines. Additives. Buffers, diluents, emulsifiers, excipients, residuals, solvents. Sodium chloride is probably benign. Egg proteins and yeast can cause severe reactions. Ammonium sulfate is a suspected liver, neuro, and respiratory toxin. Glycerin is a suspected liver, blood, and neurotoxin. Sodium borate is a suspected blood, endocrine, liver, and neurotoxin. Polysorbate 80, or tween 80, is a suspected skin and sense organ toxin. Hydrochloric acid, added to some vaccines to balance pH, is a suspected liver, immune, motor, respiratory, skin, and sense organ toxin. Sodium hydroxide is a suspected respiratory, skin, and sense organ toxin. Potassium chloride is a suspected blood, liver, and respiratory toxin. Ingredients in vaccines. Inactivating chemicals. These kill unwanted viruses and bacteria that could contaminate vaccines. Formaldehyde, or formalin, is a known carcinogen and suspected liver, immune, neuro, reproductive, respiratory, skin, and sense organ toxin. It is also used in embalming fluids. Glutaraldehyde is a suspected developmental, immune, reproductive, respiratory, skin, and sense organ toxin. 
Polyoxyethylene is a suspected endocrine toxin. How many drugs, vaccines, do babies get? Today, babies receive one vaccine at birth, eight vaccines at two months, eight vaccines at four months, nine vaccines at six months, and 12 more vaccines between 12 and 18 months of age. The pure and innocent baby is overdosed with 38 drugs by the time he or she is one and a half years old. Overdosed babies receive 38 drugs by one and a half years of age. Which drugs do babies get by one and a half years of age? According to the CDC, babies should get the following vaccine drug doses before they reach 18 months of age. Up to four doses of the hepatitis B vaccine, three doses of the rotavirus vaccine, four doses of the DTAP shot, which is for diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, four doses of the Hib vaccine for Haemophilus influenza type B, four doses of the pneumococcal vaccine, or Prevnar 13, three doses of the polio vaccine, up to two doses of the flu vaccine, two doses of the hepatitis A vaccine, one MMR shot for measles, mumps, and rubella, and one chickenpox vaccine. CDC immunization schedule, 38 drug doses by one and a half years of age. One shot equals three vaccines. DTAP and MMR are each given with a single injection but contain three vaccines. The DTAP shot contains the diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis vaccines. The MMR shot contains the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines. If you pour three shots of whiskey, gin, and rum into one glass, you're still ingesting three drinks, not just one, with all of the anticipated effects. Babies receive several vaccines at each doctor visit. Babies receive eight vaccines simultaneously at two, four, and six months of age. The drugs are injected directly into their tiny bloodstreams. Is it wise for parents to follow the CDC immunization schedule? Think twice. When did you last take eight drugs at the same time? If you took eight drugs simultaneously, would you be more surprised if you did or did not have a serious reaction? Babies may receive up to 13 vaccines at the same time. Many babies get more than eight or nine vaccines at once. Since some shot dates are variable due to age range flexibility built into the immunization schedule, it is permissible for babies to receive up to 13 drugs at their 12 month or 15 month doctor visits. CDC immunization schedule, up to 13 vaccines at one year or 15 month checkup. Babies may be injected with 13 vaccines at one time. Why are so many vaccines given at the same time? Several vaccines are given simultaneously for convenience, not safety. Parents will make fewer trips to the doctor's office. Vaccines are not tested in all of the various combinations that they are likely to be used. Vaccines are not adjusted for the weight of the child. A six pound newborn receives the same dose of hepatitis B vaccine with the same amount of aluminum and formaldehyde as a 12-pound toddler. Babies are not screened prior to vaccination to determine which ones may be more susceptible to an adverse reaction. Several vaccines are given at once. Vaccine priority is convenience, not safety. Vaccine combinations are not tested. A small infant or a big tot receives the same dose. There's no screening for high-risk babies. Is this science or mad science? What if these shots that are supposed to protect kids against disease actually hurt your child? Joining me, Barbara Lowe Fisher. I do not do as much media as I did in the 1980s and 1990s. I think there's been a concerted effort in the last uh, decade to demonize advocates like myself. Anti-vaccination bullshit. In the 21st century, it has been much harder to get the other side of the vaccine story out by a media that's increasingly only covering one side of it. Tonight on Frontline, Frontline reports on the science and politics of a bitter vaccine war. I spent half a day with a reporter who I felt was well-meaning from Frontline. We gave a long interview. Three of my prestigious colleagues, academics, scientists, also gave interviews discussing our concerns about vaccinations. Not a word of any of our interviews appeared in the PBS Frontline story. Instead of a scientific discussion presenting the facts, hysterical moms are presented against white coat, Ivy League, academics. I'm sick and tired of this. 
I see children injured every day, every day, disasters and families from vaccination injury. There has been information out there since the smallpox vaccine was created linking vaccinations to encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain, which can cause death or permanent neurological disability. I've learned recently the placebo in a vaccine trial can actually be the aluminum or the mercury or another vaccine. I would assume the placebo was normal saline, which would be like water, something not harmful. In accredited, peer-reviewed medical literature, they have linked vaccinations to chronic autoimmune problems. The science is out there. People are just choosing not to look at it. The debate is not over, and the need remains to evaluate all the components of vaccines and, and their safety or lack of safety. Our children today have elevated levels of many neurotoxins in their blood. Plastics derivatives, petrochemicals, pesticides, PCBs. Our tanks are nearly full. Our capacity to detoxify all these substances is very limited. For sure, there are certainly thousands of molecules, mostly man-made, that have been introduced into the environment over the years. And many of these have the potential to be neurotoxic. So the idea that we live in a toxic soup and that vaccines add to that toxic suit, I think is a very valid concept, but the research hasn't been done. The most common side effect of a vaccine injection is a headache. The CDC admits that over 30% of those receiving vaccines experience headaches or migraines. Gee, think about it. What could possibly be in vaccines that would cause headaches, migraines, and brain damage? Um, how about the mercury, the formaldehyde, the aluminum, and the MSG? Even if you believe in the theory of vaccines as a helpful way to train the immune system to recognize pathogens, why would anyone, especially a doctor, think it's okay to inject human beings with mercury, MSG, formaldehyde, and aluminum? If vaccines are supposed to be good for you, then why do they contain so many additives that are bad for you? You wouldn't want to eat mercury in your tuna fish. You wouldn't want MSG in a sandwich. And you certainly wouldn't want formaldehyde in your soda. So why would you allow yourself to be injected with these same deadly substances? And just as importantly, why wouldn't the vaccine industry offer clean vaccines without any brain damaging additives? Think about it. When you buy health food, you want that health food to have no mercury, no MSG and certainly no formaldehyde, no sane person would knowingly eat those neurotoxic poisons. And yet, astonishingly, those same people literally line up to be injected with those exact same brain-damaging poisons with the justification that somehow this injection is good for me. Absurdly, the vaccine industry says these toxic ingredients are intentionally added to vaccines to make them work better. Yes. That's the reason they give us. Mercury makes vaccines work better, they insist. But wait a minute. I thought the theory behind vaccines was that weakened viruses would give the immune system a kind of rehearsal so that it would build up antibodies to the real thing. Where does mercury, MSG, or formaldehyde fit anywhere in that theory? Does your body benefit in any way from exposure to formaldehyde? Of course not. The very idea is ludicrous. So are there such things as clean vaccines? I challenge you to try to find one. They simply don't exist for the population at large. Nearly all vaccines for the masses are deliberately formulated with neurotoxic chemicals that have absolutely nothing to do with the science of vaccinations, but everything to do with autism, Alzheimer's disease, early onset dementia, immune suppression, and the mass dumbing down of brain function. People, you wouldn't eat these ingredients, not by a long shot. So why do you allow yourself to be injected with them? If you really want to be healthy, 
It only makes sense that you first have to stop poisoning your brain, your organs, and your entire body with mercury, formaldehyde, MSG, and aluminum, all of which are intentionally added to vaccines and approved by the FDA and the CDC for use in vaccines. Now, finally, you might ask, well, wait a minute. If vaccines cause so much brain damage, then half the population should be brain damaged, right? The real kicker here is they are. Look around you. People are dumbed down like never before. The public education system is watered down to the point where schools are little more than daycare. Even supposedly educated adults have virtually no decision-making skills. At least half the population is walking around in a zombie state day after day. Try to talk to someone about something intelligent, like the Federal Reserve, or vaccines, GMOs, or even the truth about 9-11, and you'll quickly realize that people are dumbed down. They are brain-damaged victims of the vaccine industry. Mission accomplished by the medical poisoners, because as George Carlin once said, the very last thing the global controllers want is for people to be educated enough to ask intelligent questions about what's going on around them. You're supposed to be dumbed down, just smart enough to operate your PC at work, but so brain damaged that you can't really question anything. You're supposed to be a cog in the machine and let the government tell you what to eat, how to think, and how to live your entire life. Intelligence is the enemy of oppression. Intelligence leads to freedom, and that's why the race is on to vaccinate as many people as possible before so many of us figure out what's going on that we challenge the system. So take your vaccine shots. If you want to live a comfortable, numb, conformist life of mediocrity and ignorance, and remember, the vaccine industry will gladly reinsert you into the matrix where you can happily live out your life under the illusion that you're being taken care of.